Our scripture reading this evening comes to us from Mark chapter 14, verses 10 through 26, and it reads like this. Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priests to give Jesus up to them. When they heard it, they were delighted and promised to give him money. So he started looking for an opportunity to turn him in. On the first day of the festival of the unleavened bread, when Passover lamb was sacrificed, the disciples said to Jesus, Where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover meal? He sent them to his disciples and said to them, Go into the city. A man carrying a water jar will meet you. Follow him. Wherever he enters, say to the owner of the house, The teacher asks, Where is my guest room where I can eat the Passover meal with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs already furnished, prepared for us there. The disciples left and came to the city. They found everything just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover meal. That evening, Jesus arrived with the twelve. During the meal, Jesus said, I assure you that one of you will betray me, someone eating with me. Deeply saddened, they asked him one by one, It's not me, is it? Jesus answered, It is one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread with me into this bowl. The human one goes to his de death, just as it is written about him. But how terrible it is for that person who betrays the human one. It would have been better for him if he had never been born. And while they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it, and broke it and gave it to them, and said, Take, this is my body. And then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, and they drank from it. He said to them, This is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. I assure you that I won't drink wine again until that day when I drink it in a new way in God's kingdom. After singing songs of praise, they then went out to the Mount of Olives. And here ends the reading. They got a blessing to the reading, the hearing, and the living of his holy word. Amen. Well, friends, it's been a, a busy Holy Week in the farmer household. Uh, I'm sure you've probably heard that a lot of the kids are on spring break, as are my two daughters, and they've been at home. Um, but unfortunately, we got that crazy sickness bug that's been going around. Uh, it started with my youngest daughter, Scarlett, um, on, on Friday into Saturday. My wife got it Sunday, and I thought I was going to avoid it. Um, but unfortunately, I got it then on Monday. So it's been kind of a, a crazy week around my house. Uh, but on Sunday, as my oldest daughter and I were watching a little TV, my youngest got up and we heard her kind of tiptoe out and out of our family room down the hallway. And all of a sudden I heard this sound that sounded like, like water, like liquid going everywhere. And then, and then I heard it again. And I said, Scarlett, are, are you okay? And she goes, no, no, dad, I'm, I'm throwing up. And just as she said that, boom, another round hit again. So I came out into the, into the hallway in the kitchen area and saw a complete mess. Now, to be honest with you, despite my undergrad being in biology, and I've dissected lots of animals over the years and can deal with all that stuff, I am terrible when it comes to puke and poop. And lo and behold, that's what's there. A huge mess of throw up from, from my youngest. And as she's getting into the bathroom and finishing what she had to do, I'm sitting there with a huge mess and a wife upstairs who's also sick. And yet, I have this duty, this responsibility to take care of Scarlett, to take care of this mess, to clean it up, even though it's certainly not what I want to do, and I certainly don't feel the skill set to do it. I know I have a duty and a responsibility to my daughter to do that. And I'm sure you might have similar situations if you have kids or maybe you, you have a spouse. And when you take that vow to, to love them in sickness and in health, that can lead you to have to do some, some pretty gross and some, some unpleasant things. Or maybe you have a, a puppy or an animal at home and yeah, they, they get sick too and have their accidents. Sometimes it's a part of that duty and responsibility that, that overtakes us and gets us through that difficult situation. And as I was cleaning up, and as Scarlett had finished and had realized that she needed to probably go take a shower and stuff, she said to me, Dad, Daddy, I'm sorry. Next time, I'll try to make it into the can. And I said, sweetie, 
it was an accident. I know you're not feeling good. It's okay. Daddy will clean it up. You go, you go clean yourself up. As I enter this week of Holy Week and the messiness and nastiness and, and unpleasantness that's surrounded with Jesus' trial, with his walking through the streets of Jerusalem, with his death, I think about what, what is going on around him, but also what Jesus might have known was going to happen. I think about Jesus and him telling the disciples that somebody's going to betray me, somebody's going to deny me, somebody's going to give me up. Jesus, I think, knew exactly what was going to happen and what had to happen. Yet he did it because of his duty, because of his responsibility, but because he so loved us, he knew that that's what he had to do to save us. He knew that people were talking around him after Palm Sunday and he entered the city. He knew that the religious elites, that the political leaders were trying to set him up, were trying to prevent the crowds from rising up against them and questioning their power, yet they knew that Jesus had done nothing wrong. So they were looking for a way to set him up, to turn the crowds against him, and to then justify their killing of him. I think he knew the mess that he was about to face, the unjust trial, the spitting, the ridicule, the whipping, the beating, the stripping of his clothes. It was going to be unpleasant and messy. Several years back, I remember before even going to seminary, watching the movie, The Passion of the Christ. And I don't know if you've watched that or not, but that's a very graphic depiction of what happened. And while it's a very moving picture, it also falls short of what really happened. I can't begin to imagine the smells, the sounds, the feelings and emotions that even the movie couldn't capture around this event. And yet, during this time, we hear from Scripture this evening that Jesus took time to care for those around him. He wanted to make sure they were taken care of and that a meal was prepared for them so they could celebrate the traditional Passover feast. He wanted to give them a way to remember him, to celebrate his life, and to then live the way that he taught us to live. And so he gave them that, that first Last Supper, that first Lord's Supper. I find this to be very meaningful in my personal life as well. It's one of the reasons why I am pleased to say that I'm going to be uh, ordained this summer as a provisional elder. I find it very meaningful to break bread together, to be able to offer that similar meal to us this evening and going forward throughout my career. Yet during this time of sharing and, and fellowshipping and breaking bread, when Jesus shares that bad news that one of you is going to betray me, the response from all of them, it says in Mark's Gospel, is, is it, is it me, Lord? Is, is it I? Surely it, it, it couldn't be me, God. It couldn't be I, the one who betrays you. I, I've been a good follower. I've been to church every Sunday. I've been doing what you said. I've been listening and paying attention, right? It couldn't, it couldn't be me, God. I think if we're honest with ourselves, we tend to read ourselves into the best parts of the story. Of course, if we were a disciple, we would have understood all the parables. We would have gotten all the foreshadowing that Jesus told us. We would have seen how he was connecting the dots between the Old Testament scriptures and what was happening now right before us. We, we would have even started probably the best modern church service that there could have been to worship Jesus afterwards, right? Yet if we're honest, we all know that we fall short that we betray Jesus by how we live and what we say and what we do, and especially what we leave undone. We betray Jesus who told us, as the Gospel of John tells us, who told us that he, we are to love each other as he has loved us. Every time we ignore, we ignore the cries of people in our community who are victims of trauma, we deny Jesus. Every time we ignore the cries of the hungry and the homeless, the widow, the addict, we deny Jesus. Every time we turn a blind eye to the plight of the refugee, the immigrant, the disabled, we deny Jesus. And we deny care and comfort and love to the people that Jesus cared most about, the least of these. Even in today's scripture, we didn't read it, but a couple of verses beforehand, it says that Jesus was in the house 
of a leper. He was relaxing and reclining and enjoying his time there. A leper, somebody who was ostracized from society. That's where Jesus found solitude, found rest, found relaxation. It's with the least of these. When we deny Jesus, we put up things like street signs that tell people that their money would be better spent on systems that have already fail failed the people who are there begging for money. And yet, despite our human messiness, despite our failings and our denials, Jesus still accepts that journey to the cross. Jesus still goes to the cross anyway because he wants to clean up our messiness clean up our social and political and economic and relational messiness, our vomit, if you will. But we can do better, and we know we can. We can work for a world that shows Jesus' love. That's why I consider it a blessing to have worked with you all for the past several years and to be a part of Canton for All People. I think it's my long road of helping to clean up those times when I denied and continue to deny Jesus by turning a blind eye. Every time we, we house a family, we feed a family, we provide a safe place for a kid to learn or a, a meal for that kid to have over the weekend. When we provide groceries for the week or we cover an electric bill or a down payment to get somebody into safe, affordable living. When we listen and take time to share a cup of coffee or just a few moments to, to listen and to pray for one another. We heal some of that human brokenness and respond rightly to that love that God shows us, that Jesus shows us, not only in this meal that we're about to celebrate, but shows us all the way up to the point of the cross and beyond. It's my way. It's my way of saying to God, Dad, I'm sorry I messed up, but I'll try to do better next time. So yes, I'm going to miss being with you all in a few months when my reappointment comes and I, I go to Akron. I'll miss breaking bread with you all and eating and sharing a cup of coffee with men's prayer group or going out to, to dinner on Sunday or lunch on Sundays after church. But I know that that work that we've done together will continue. I know that our need to fill the needs of humans around us will continue for us to be a light into the world and to show Jesus' love to others just as he shows it to us, and we remember that love, especially here this Holy Week. So yes, while there are trying times ahead for ourselves, and there are trying times ahead for Jesus, we should be like him as we face those trying times, as our responsibility as Christians, as our duty to respond to Christ's love for us, and help carry his message out into the world, even though we know that Sunday's coming, we still have that responsibility to share it, to show it, and to live that love. And so as we continue this week to remember Christ's sacrifice, this evening his prayer time, tomorrow his journey to the cross and death, and then Saturday and coming together again on Sunday to celebrate the glorious resurrection, let us turn now to this table and to this meal as we remember Christ's sacrifice and his love for us and is giving us of the Lord's Supper. Will you pray with me? Holy Lord Jesus, you are certainly God's blessed Son. When we turned aside from your way and abused your gifts, God, you gave us Jesus, your crowning gift, emptying himself that our joy might be fulfilled. While he was here on earth, he fed the hungry, he healed the sick, he ate with the scorn and the forgotten, he washed his disciples' feet and gave a holy meal as a pledge of his abiding presence. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church and delivered us from slavery to sin and to death and made with us a new covenant by water and by spirit. On the night on which he gave himself up for us that we remember here today, he took bread, he gave thanks to you, he broke the bread and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup and gave thanks to you and gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my body. This is my blood 
of the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these mighty acts of Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves now in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered wherever we might be and on our gifts of bread and juice. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body and blood of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ and one with each other and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And now I invite you to take your bread. And as we remember Christ's sacrifice for us, may you break it and take and eat. This is Christ's body, broken for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sin. And now take your juice and remember Christ's blood poured out for you and for, for many, for the redemption for all people. Will you pray with me? Awesome and loving God, we give you thanks for this holy meal, for this mystery meal in which Jesus taught us about his love and his forgiveness and prepared us to go to the cross with him. As we continue to journey this week with him to the cross and to the eventual glory and victory over death, may we be blessed and be safe and be willing to do the hard things, the hard things that help to show your love into our broken world. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now may you go from this space, as the disciples once did, to their Mount of Olives, to yours, wherever that peaceful space might be, to pray, to reflect, and prepare for what's to come tomorrow. May you go in peace. May you live in peace. Amen.